I know I am separating you from your lunch, and so I will make this fast and exciting, and there will be cartoons, and it will be fun. <clears throat> and uh, So uh, I am a bibliometrics librarian. Anybody who doesn't know what bibliometrics are, is, we're familiar with that? Good. Um, unfortunately, nobody else at McMaster knows what that is, and so I get questions a lot about how many publications did my department come up with last year? How many citations? And yes, ultimately, bibliometrics is at its most superficial level about counting citations, but there's so much more to it. If you look for patterns in the metadata, you can see trends over time. And in fact, back in 1964, one of the first uses of the Science Citation Index was to create a visualization of research fronts over time. 1964, with, I guess, pencil and paper. Um, <clears throat> that's not what I'm doing today. But just to give you a, a little hint of what you can do with data besides citations. Um, so today I'm talking about a range of uh, data sources and uh, applications you can use. Um, it's going to look like a bit of a smorgasbord, a bit of a buffet, and that's the intention. Because at the very end, I'm going to show you how you can stick them all together, A, B, C, D and get something out of it. Um, so uh, it's a little, it'll look disorganized, and in fact, that's what this graph is. It is disorganized, um, but it all comes together at the end. Hang in there. <laughs> uh, in a sense, I am doing the role of uh, panoramics. You know panoramics from the Asterix cartoons, otherwise known in English as getafix is his uh, name. <clears throat> and in it, what he's doing here is he's going around, he's collecting herbs that he's later going to put together in a big pot and make a magic potion. Uh, and in a sense, that's what we're doing here. I'm talking about open Alex, about R, about SQLite, and small teams. And I'm going to put it all together in a big pot at the end. <clears throat> so this is not my research. I'm just assembling these Lego blocks in a novel way and showcasing some data sources that you've perhaps not heard of so that you can go play with them too. Uh, the results are for you to use, and let me know what you discover. I was inspired by uh, this paper here. Uh, it's a group of sociologists at Northwestern University in Chicago, I think. Um, Evans, Evans and Li Fang Wu, and there's another guy too, David Evans. And their paper uh, made a big splash a few years ago. It was. Uh, published in Nature, and their title is Large Teams Develop Science and Small Teams Disrupt Science and Technology. In the field of bibliometrics, which is the study of the evolution of scientific research, people have noticed that, well, over time, over the 20th century, the size of research teams has grown, as you would imagine. You know, 100 years ago, we had Albert Einstein all by himself with a piece of chalk. Nowadays, we have something like CERN with thousands of physicists all working together. It's, it's grown over time. At the same time, bibliometricians have discovered quite recently, uh, it was Vincent Larivière from University of Montreal who published this um, about in 2015, 2016, that collaborations, particularly international collaborations, tend to produce research that gets cited more often. Right? So it's great that people are collaborating together and you know, the dean and the provost want to see that you're collaborating with other researchers and other universities. It's good because it's good for the university. You get more citations. However, what these people are discovering is that science can be too big. That when you get large groups of people working on the same research project, it tends to be kind of conservative. It tends to be, as you would imagine, it tends to produce research that is less innovative. It gets a lot of citations, but it doesn't really move the goalposts necessarily. And so you see that in the little chart that uh, the small teams people came up with there at the, the Northwestern University. So in uh, green, the green bar uh, line, is how disruptive, however they measure that, disruptive an article is. Um, and it starts out being quite high at the same time as the 
red line shows the citations. It's very disruptive, but it doesn't make a big splash. Um, and that's correlated with the size of the team, the number of researchers. The more people you have, the more impact you get, but it tends to be kind of safe research. And they've also come up with these very pretty visualizations of the um, disruptiveness of particular articles. So vertically is, uh, is by year. Um, and I think they've taken a bit of artistic license to do this. Um, you could have just done an XY graph, you know, um, but they've come up with these very pretty fern diagrams. Um, I don't know how they did it. Uh, over on the left-hand side would be a highly disruptive, D is equal to 0.91, um, highly disruptive graph, and they <clears throat> embellish that with pretty colors. And over on the right-hand side is a bad, very um, sickly-looking weed of a non-disruptive paper with a negative disruption score of negative 0.42. Wouldn't it be nice to do that at McMaster? Gee, I wish, how do they do that? You know, so my motivation is to leverage this small team's data set to identify McMaster's most innovative, not its most cited, research. And theoretically, we could use this in strategic planning. Um, how can McMaster differentiate itself from other universities? How can we do research that is not perhaps the safest, but over the long term will have more of an impact? And I want to find out how they do these ferns. Um, <clears throat> luckily, they have made their data set open. The small team's data set is available online at that link right there. It is 19.4 megabytes. Just download it. It's real easy. And that's what it looks like. It's a CSV file. Um, mag paper ID, the year the article was published, what field it was in. So there's some, usually they use binary indicators there. The team size, there was one person. Was it collaborative? Zero. No. One person. Can't collaborate person, and so on and so forth, until the last column gives you the description score. Well, that's fascinating, but I have no idea what the title of the paper is, or what journal it's in, or the page numbers, or who wrote it. I've just got this mag ID, mag paper ID. What the heck's that? I've got nothing to go with here. How do I make this relevant to McMaster? So it occurred to me that MAG, where have I seen that before? MAG. Turns out that they're talking about the Microsoft Academic Graph, which you've perhaps not heard of. Uh, we all know Google Scholar. Google Scholar, students use it, uh, much to my dismay. Um, <clears throat> but Microsoft came out with a similar sort of database about five years ago. Very experimental, not really a competitor to Google Scholar, Microsoft Academic Graph was really about exploring semantic relationships. So you'd put in, you'd search for dolphin, and it would understand that really what you wanted was the concept of things that are cute and swim in the ocean. And it would find your results that way, whether they contained the word dolphin or not. Um, and then they shut it down last year. So you can get the Microsoft Academic Graph um, that, uh, people in the community were uh, um, rather perturbed by this, and so they jumped on it, and they've incorporated Microsoft Academic Graph into something called Open Alex, which is a new, free-to-use, bibliographic, bibliometric database of 250 million works. And it's very convenient that I should be presenting right after the previous presenter, who talked about unpaywall unpaywall, you know, they've been the last talk. Well, the people behind Open Paywall, uh, Unpaywall are the same people who've made Open Alex. Interesting segue there, <clears throat> if you will. Now, that would be um, Heather Piwawar, who's um, based in Vancouver, and uh, Jason Preem. They are both the, um, the actors behind a, a little nonprofit organization called Our Research. They've done some very innovative stuff, including Open Alex. 250 million works, about 50,000 are added every day. And one of the article accession numbers that they use is the Microsoft Academic Graph Mag ID. Well, there we are. So the solution is that Microsoft Academic Graph is no more, but it lives on. Ha ha. And you can go and retrieve the metadata for a given article using this URL, explorer.openalex.org, 
da 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 with the mag paper ID at the very end. So there we go, there's the solution. We've got the small teams data set, and we know how to resolve the metadata by linking it with, uh, with OpenAlex. Great, but that's just one at a time. And you'll remember that the small teams data set is 19.4 megabytes of text. So I'm not gonna do this one by one. Um, magic is possible via OpenAlex because there's an API and some bright guy at the University of Naples named Massimo Aria has released an R package called, conveniently, OpenAlex R. The name says it all um, right there. And so this is a, an example of a query. Uh, you build a query, you're looking for works, that is to say publications. Uh, I'm going to filter by a particular institution ID, so that'll be like Dalhousie or McGill or something like that. And Bada boom, bada bing, you get all the articles in Open Alex from that university with their mag IDs. Right? See where I'm going with this? And then I can use, I can bring the, the small teams data set in to, uh, uh, as a data frame in R, and I can bring the results from Open Alex in as a data frame in R, and then conveniently I can just shuffle them together using a SQL query. And there we have um, <clears throat> panoramics again. And this is the recipe. Uh, you use, you need OpenAlex R, you need the small teams data set, and you need an RSQLite package. You load the small teams data set into a data frame. You query OpenAlex using the, the OpenAlex R package for all the records from your university, my university. You use RSQLite to store the data frames as tables. I suppose you could just do it straight with, with the data frames. You don't have to do the extra step of a SQL query, but I like using SQL because I've been using it forever, so there we are. Um, and then in the end, what you get is the disruption score of all the articles from University X. And that's what the code looks like. Um, I've made it available on my GitHub, jeffdomain.github.io, recipe for magic, it's right there. Um, and I have, uh, <clears throat> for, if you don't see yourself as much of a chef or you don't feel like cooking, that's okay. Um, because I've done the cooking for you. Um, on the website of the GitHub, I've gone and pulled all of the articles from these universities for the year 2020 and match them up with their disruption scores. If you don't see your university there, that's okay. Come talk to me. It only takes 10 minutes. So we'll do it later. Um, so for example, um, Carlton, there are 210 articles from 2020 that for which we have a disruption score. Now, I don't know what that means, but it'd be interesting to track those articles over time and see if they are not necessarily getting a lot of citations, but whether they are innovative, whether they're changing the game a bit. For example, the highest disruption score, I don't know why they use 17 decimals, it's really not that necessary. Um, I think three or four would do it, but um, <clears throat> there you have it. So there's a, two articles, one with a very high disruption score, one with the lowest. What happens to these articles? Um, does it make a difference? Is there a correlation between, I don't know, patents, uh, altmetric score? Do these highly disruption, disruptive articles get a lot of attention in the social media? And how can I, as a bibliometrician, use this new metric to, well, help McMaster differentiate itself? There we go. That was quick and fun, and there were cartoons. So, thanks. Any questions? Sit down. Have you explored disruption scores based on discipline? No, but that would be a good one. Yes. Okay. So because. 
we've got the DOIs, and I know now which author produced which paper, then it would be fairly easy to match that up with our, uh, we have a RIS, uh, a CRIS system, um, research information system, you know. Um, so yeah, we could do it by department as well because we would be able to match up on DOI who's working in engineering, who's working in chemistry. That would be the next step. That would be interesting. I think that might be... Nice. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah what is the definition of disruption? Uh, no, it's not my definition. It's, again, it's not my research. It's their research. Go read the papers from the, the uh, team at uh, Northwestern University, Li Feng Wu and um, David Evans. Um, other applications. Al uh, Open Alex is huge, and it's still very experimental. It's not actually released for public consumption just yet. It's still under development, um, but it's brand new and it's huge um, and it's free. I don't understand the business model behind it, but um, it's more metadata for us to work with. It's great. Um, as I was saying just at, at the break, you know, when I started doing this a million years ago, there was only one game in town. It was Web of Science. It was the only company, it was the only data set available. And then 15 years ago, Elsevier came out with Scopus. Well, that's two. Five years ago, uh, the, uh, the Nature Group came out with Dimensions. So there's three databases. Now we've got, because things are um, open access, a lot of articles are open access, anybody can scrape the metadata from Crossref and build their own database. Um, and so there's been, over the past two years, there's been an explosion of these brand new giant databases out there uh, that are free to use. So OpenAlex is one. Uh, in the UK, there's something called Core by JISC. JISC is the, so the Science Council of, of the UK. Uh, in the EU, they've got something called Open Air, which pulls together all of the, all of the um, theses and data sets that are uh, uploaded to uh, institutional repositories around the world, links them all together. Millions, tens, hundreds of millions of records free. So is disruption something you can calculate going forward? If I could figure out how they did it, um, then that would be great um, because their data set goes up to 2021 and I don't think, oh, unless they update it, I'll let them do that. You know, I've got enough on my plate. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll let the Li Feng Wu and the folks in the Chicago update it. Um, but yeah, in theory, the algorithm is, is written in their paper, and so you could calculate it yourself. So, I have no idea how to do that. Don't ask me. So. <laughs> okay, thanks. Bye.